Aloha everyone. I'm your Minna Van Dyken MD. I'm a surgeon by trade, but my true passion is helping people just like you obtain and maintain optimum health, especially in these strange times of COVID. If you've been following us for a little while, I've posted a few videos discussing nitric oxide, endogenous production of nasal nitric oxide, and prevention, possibly even treatment of COVID-19. I'll link those videos in the description below. But now, I've been so lucky to spend time with Chris Miller, PhD. Chris is one of the world's nitric oxide experts, and he's one of the co-founders of a company called Sanotize, a nasal nitric oxide delivery spray. He's currently their chief science officer. In this discussion, we talk about nitric oxide as well as the development of the nitric oxide nasal spray. We explore how it works, especially against COVID-19, scientific studies done thus far, and the studies that are planned for the future. And lastly, we touch on the company's plans to distribute the spray widely. It's a great interview, and I definitely learned quite a bit. So without further ado, I bring you Chris Miller. I hope you enjoy. Aloha, everybody. As we talked about in the introduction, I'm your Minna Van Dyken, MD. Um, I'm a surgeon by trade, but I'm really developing an interest in nitric oxide and nitric oxide technology these days. So I have the great, great pleasure to um, be sitting here speaking with Dr. Chris Miller. Chris Miller is um, one of the pioneers in developing nitric oxide technology, and he joins us from uh, Canada, from Vancouver. Hi, Chris. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about your background, um, your training, how you got interested in nitric oxide in the first place? Sure. My, uh, my background is in, uh, as a, originally a respiratory therapist back in the, in the eighties. And, um, <clears throat> I became very fascinated. I read an article about this new, this new gas they discovered in 1987. And I was fascinated because it's a gas and how many, how many drugs are gas? And of course I was a respiratory therapist. So that's all about delivering oxygen and rest, um, ventilatory support and things like that in the intensive care unit. And, and so it fascinated me. And so um, I was preparing to go back and, and do some, uh, my PhD or my master's. And, um, and I became fascinated with this molecule. This molecule is nitric oxide. And at the time, very few people knew anything about it. And so I, uh, I did a, uh, a, a literature review and I published it in, in 1992, October of 1992. And, uh, and at that time it was known only really as a um, poisonous gas. Wow. And, uh, and so, but, and it produced in, you know, it was with, with uh, pollution and things like that. And so um, became very fascinated. How did this get to be a, a drug? So, and it turns out that the, the guys that eventually won the Nobel prize in this area discovered that there was this thing called big long word endothelium derived relaxing factor EDRF turned out it was nitric oxide and a couple of groups identified it as a, a gas, and that's why we didn't know it was there. And it was the basically the um, the molecule that many of us are familiar with in medicine, as far as nitroglycerin, right? So it's a vasodilator produced in the endothelial cells and relaxes the blood vessels. And so that was the initial research in that area. That's where I became involved in it. Developed uh, some devices to measure nitric oxide because no one knew anything about it. So I published this article. And and turned out that it was probably one of the first review articles in medicine, and uh, of course it was in the respiratory magazine, so it wasn't in uh, PubMed at the time. And uh, but it turns out it's a it's a it, 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 sort of one of those fortuitous things that you look back on, and that was really the, what started my career in nitric oxide. And so working with Blue Babies, doing some of the original research with. Uh, how to deliver it safely, how to measure it, all those kinds of things, and got involved. Had it was started a biotech company um, to be able to measure and deliver nitric oxide. Anyways, but my real interest was in the other uses as things emerged in the literature and people started looking at nitric oxide. One of the things that fascinated me was 
the nitric oxide was used and produced probably in your nose or somewhere. And, uh, and so again, doing some self research on myself, putting tube down my nose, measuring nitric oxide, those kind of things, realized there was a lot of nitric oxide being produced in your upper airway. And then of course, doing some other literature review, talking to others and realized that our bodies produce nitric oxide as a defense in the immune system. Of course, back then, everybody thought I was crazy. It was poisonous gas. And also that only, only rodents produce nitric oxide in the body. And that's what we knew. But as things have gone forward, we now realize that nitric oxide is a very key messenger, secondary messenger molecule. It's used in basically, and it's produced in every single um, body system. And it's really important. But my interest lay in its ability to kill microbes. And so I ended up doing my master's PhD using gaseous nitric oxide or exogenous gas, you know, gas from cylinders to, to see if it was uh, antibacterial. And so started there and did my PhD in that area. And uh, from there went forward and used it in inhalational and, and I've served published in that area quite a bit in the early 2000 era. And then ask myself, boy, this is really complicated with pressurized gas cylinders and, and all this equipment, you know, for blue babies and using that in people that maybe have TB. And, you know, I did research and I had ongoing research in, against uh, TB, non tuberculous mycobacteria, treating lung infections. But it's very cumbersome. And so I wanted to come up with a different way that we could use it topically. And so enter in 2008, 2010, in that area, I met a biochemist from Israel named Gilly Regev. And uh, we started, I said, listen, we got to be able to figure out a different way to deliver this. So we kind of back engineered our own stuff, like the gaseous nitric oxide getting into liquid and being antimicrobial. We started there, back engineered our own kind of ideas and came up with a liquid that produced nitric oxide. And then we started doing testing on it. And then we decided, because I'd been involved in biotech before, is that it's really good to have a patent first. Yeah, and so, for sure. So we did a patent, which was very difficult in this area because nitric oxide is a naturally occurring molecule, so you can't patent it. So it was a device, it was the formulation, things like that. And so in 2017, we, we established the company Sanitize, Research and Development Corp for the purpose of using this nitric oxide releasing solution to treat respiratory and, and uh, topical infections, wound infections. And that's where we started. So that's where we started. And we started looking at, of course, doing in vitro, doing in vivo work. And, and so prior to the COVID, we were, diligently working in a phase two trial for chronic sinusitis okay as a, as a nasal lavage you know mm -hmm. like the, you've heard of the neil med bottle that you know and you flush your nose yeah like kind of like a neti pot something well, similar that's to that exactly a neti mm -hmm. pot that's exactly a lot of people don't know that that's going on in, but it's basically saline or a buffered solution and they you wash the viruses or wash the things out of your nose and sinus area. So mm -hmm. we, we were in phase two trials, very successfully moving forward in phase two trials with the, our nitric oxide releasing solution as that would be an antibacterial. We'd already done lots of research with uh, treating cattle, replacing antibiotics when they go into the feedlot with this wash to get rid of viruses that cause viral pneumonia so that oh, you don't have wow. antibiotics in cows. And so we did thousands of cows and published and showed that it was just as effective. So I'm just trying to like picture um, shooting this stuff up a cow's nose. Like, how okay. does that work? Well, it was, you know, that whole industry was quite new to me because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in medicine, you know, like you, you know, like yeah. we were in our coveralls and minus... 35 degrees Celsius weather on the prairies in Canada wow. and in these cows that come in and they, these 
sort of not baby cows, but cows that come in from the farms come into a central feedlot. Well, when they come in, they normally get what they call, of course, in medicine, we'd never say use prophylactic antibiotics, but they yeah. use, they have a new word. It's called metaphylactic antibiotics, which prevents oh. the crowd. And so that's why they use antibiotics and helps them grow and it protects them. It's like sending kids from kindergarten, from home to kindergarten. They all get the, the flu kind of thing, right? Right, so, right. So we were just using this as a lavage. And we used that in the beginning, we used it like a, a garden sprayer. Just put it in the nose and spray it. And then we came up with a very elaborate automatic system working with a pharmaceutical company. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So we got very good results. But we kind of, we always thought we'd use this as a spray for, uh, for uh, the flu and influenza. Because we, we did in vitro work and it works fantastic. At, at, at any virus, basically. Sure. But to do those kinds of studies, it takes a lot of money. Yes, it, it does. Takes, like we're just designing a phase three trial right now for, for uh, Anovid. And uh, it's uh, 14,000, we need 14,000 patients. So we never did that in prior to COVID because it was just, wasn't cost effective. So in our pipeline, it was down lower. So we were working on, um, as I had mentioned, um, sinusitis and also diabetic foot ulcers. And we had a grant from the U.S. Department of Defense. So we we're working happily in that area. But then COVID came out. Those studies went on hold because of isolation. And we said, wow, we really need to sort of pivot here and help. And we think we can help people. So we, we started and engaged in that. And now we're, now we're, we're just going crazy here trying to meet the need and 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 trying to get approvals and certainly more than we had intended to bite off that's for sure for sure wow that's that's impressive so going back to the actual solution um i know you had said it's not it's not really like a nitric oxide gas obviously because it's a liquid is it kind of like a precursor then that you're you're using in the solution and shooting up your nose and it gets converted or what yeah so nitric oxide as you probably know is really it's short acting mm -hmm. and it's really hard to deal with right because yeah it has a half-life of less than a second right yeah, yeah yeah so so how do you do it and so that's kind of our our know-how is what this this is for right right in the bottle, there's no nitric in the bottle, but when it sprays out, the components go together and within the liquid, it produces nitric oxide. So the right. gaseous molecules are, are microscopic and they're inside the liquid. And the best way for me to explain it is consider, um, um, what are they called? My wife uses it all the time. She puts the bottle in and goes, you know, the soda, Soda. Oh, like a soda stream or something? Soda stream. It's like oh, a soda yeah. Stream. Yeah, yeah. And so inside there's the gas, right? In the mm -hmm. liquid. So the gas literally is in the liquid. When the two things come together, it reacts. It makes within the liquid nitric oxide molecules. And the nitric oxide molecule, you have to realize, is the one of, well, it's probably the smallest molecule in our body that's used as a messenger molecule. I like to tell people like, you know, medical students like, hey, nitric oxide, think of it this way. A, if you were to say be in a room and you had a, uh, uh, an antibiotic, an antibiotic would be the size of the room. Whereas nitric oxide would be the size of the, your baby fingernail. Wow. So that's the difference in size. It's not a, it's a micro, it's a truly a nanomolecule. So this nanomolecule it's very small and it gets through membranes as lipophilic. It can pass through membranes and it's very, very small. So there's a lot of nitric inside this liquid. Got it. So, so you put the liquid on the surface, then it's available, right? Mm -hmm. And then essentially it's instantly absorbed through the mucosal membrane or how is that? Yeah. Work? So we're not, so there's what's interesting is in the beginning. Yeah. I'm not trying to bore you. This sounds like, Oh, no, this is super interesting. So, when we first, when COVID first came out, no one really knew what the pathogenesis was. What was it in that people were complaining of sore throats? People, you know, where, what was the entry? Was it entry through the mucosal membranes in the eyes or was it aerosol generated? And there was all this stuff. 
what we did is we said, okay, we're going to throw the whole kitchen sink out. We're going to have a study, prevention study, that's going to have gargle. We're going to have nasal lavage, and we're going to have nasal spray. So we're going to throw the whole kitchen sink at these people to help them prevent. So that's what we first did. But now, as we've learned a lot over this last year, in many ways, we've learned that the primary entry and probably over 90%, it happens right here. Right. Yep. Right here, the ACE2 receptors and the epithelial cells, that's where the action is. So what I like to tell people, people always say, how does nitric work? Because that's probably your next question. So you have this liquid, you have all these little molecules in it. And then while well, you spray it in your nose, what the heck happens is they produce gas and you go into the lungs or, you know, cause that's what we traditionally had done is have bulk gas flow in the ventilator circuit and you, you inhale a lot of it and then it goes into your bloodstream anyways. So that's, that's the traditional way. Well, ours is very localized. So you spray it on your nose and cover your nasal cavity with this liquid. So part of the liquid is a, it's a, it's a surfactant we put in it so it stays and spreads really evenly across the epithelial cells. So within that liquid is nitric oxide molecule. And so I will now share with you, can I share with you? the? Yes, picture? please do, please. So people ask me, well, hey, how does it work? What's the mechanism of action? Because typically, you know, drugs have one mechanism of action, right? Well, I like to talk about mechanisms of action of nitric oxide. Mm. So this slide may look a little busy, but if you just sim simply go through, you number one is physical and chemical barriers. So you, you have this liquid come in, it covers the epithelial surface and it has a mechanical barrier because it has, has, a, has a, a, a little bit of viscosity. So the viruses kind of get stuck in there. But within that liquid, there's a lower pH, which is a hostile environment. So there's a physical and chemical barrier, but the the magic sauce, so to speak, in that liquid layer on top of the epithelial cell is, is the nitric oxide. And the nitric oxide, what it does is number two there, it's viricidal, directly viricidal. So NO, what we call nitrosylate cysteine moieties, and all that means is a nitric, it has an affinity to, to iron-based enzymes and targets. And so what it does, is on the surface, and everybody knows about the spike protein now. So on the surface of all these viruses that we deal with are, are, are targets that have iron in them. And so the nitric binds to those. And what it does is it changes the conformation or changes the shape of the virion that prevents it from fusing or attaching to the cell. So when I talk this, I talk very general. I'm not talking just coronavirus. I'm talking about multiple viruses, all kinds of viruses that, that fuse with the cell. So the mm -hmm. nitric basically directly prevents the virion or the inactive virus from interacting with, with the, the host cell. So it can't get inside and take over. So it, it basically is viricidal and, and gets rid of it and inactivates it. So that's one mechanism of action. So now I talk about that is like the, for a metaphor, um, that is like if you have a key, the key being the virus and the human cell as the lock, the lock goes into the, into the, the key goes into the lock, right? So now we've messed up the key. So the key can't go into the lock. Now what nitric also does, which is, I think from a medical perspective, it's so exciting. It binds to the ACE2 receptor, which we know is super important, especially with coronavirus. And so it is like pouring super glue into the lock. So now we don't, the key doesn't, we messed up the key. Now we're messing up the lock. So the chances of it binding or getting into infecting the cell is very low. So those are the main three main, main things. But then on top of all of this is um, nitric oxide is lipophilic. So it passes through cell membranes super easy. So it's not like, you know, like, um, since it's lipophilic, it passes through. And so being an nanomolecule as well, goes into the cell. Well, what does it do inside the cell? Inside the infected cell, what it does is it messes with the mRNA transcription by binding to the enzymes. And so it messes up with the viral RNA synthesis. So 
not myself, but others have shown very clearly that nitric oxide interferes with viral replication inside the cell, okay? So then on top of that, it, it directly is RNA, DNA, deamination, right? So those are all the mechanisms. On top of it, because of the inhibition or the blocking of the ACE2 receptors, it prevents, even if the cell is, is taken over by the virus and replicating, it has to get out. The, the virus has to bud out of the cell to, to reinfect other cells, right? So it replicates inside and then it sort of um, uh, buds out depending on your virus. And so the nitric oxide with the ACE receptor also prevents it from releasing. Oh, that's so, interesting. Yeah, I never so, thought of it that way. Right, so it's also, go, it prevents going in and prevents going out. And then on top of all, so those are the basic mechanisms of action. Now, those are all hypothetical. And the question is, does it really work, right? Right. So that bring on the next question is, well, how did you guys prove that it actually works? So we've been, of course, very diligent during this COVID time. And um, so we did, of course, some animal models, but the real model is the human model. So we went to the UK who um, we worked with them. And so we did what was called a randomized controlled um, trial, treatment trial. So we, we used uh, the, we compared our nasal spray to saline nasal spray. And that's a really high bar because, um, you know, we didn't want to be criticized that, oh, you just have a spray, you're just washing out the viruses out of the nose. Because right. we do know that, that saline nasal lavage or saline nasal sprays do get rid of some of the viral count, right? Mm -hmm. So what we did is we designed it to compare the both and we, we, we did the study and we completed it and we got spectacular results. We were able to reduce the, basically the viral load within 24 hours from a super high level to very low level in individuals that tested first of all with that symptoms and they had um, tested positive for um, COVID-19 and we intervened at that point and we, they used it five to six times a day, just sprayed it in throughout the day. And then we, we followed them for nine days because we also know now that really all the viruses go away after about 10 days. Right. And so we don't need to follow them that far. The most important, so the most important way to tell if it's working is in the first 72 hours. Do you reduce the viral load more than the placebo? And mm -hmm. what we found was phenomenal, a phenomenal result is that, is that it reduced it so fast and so quick in 24, 74 hours compared to the control that, that basically brought it down to the non-detection level. And so, so that's pretty exciting. At least I think it's exciting. No, that's incredible. Chris, can I stop the screen sharing so I can make you big again on my recording? Yeah, yeah I was going to show you the, oh. the, the result there. No, was, show me the results. That would be great. So I was um, going to show you. Go ahead. You probably have lots of questions. Well, I was just going to say one thing that the time frame of all this, right, was that most of these were not just your garden variety COVID, right? They were variants of concern. Yes. And that is the other thing is we remember I had explained earlier is that the virus the nitric oxide is sort of non-discriminatory, which, you know, as I tell people, you know, it's not surprising because it's our first line of defense in our body, nitric oxide. Right. So it's going to be non-discriminatory, right? And so it gets rid of all kinds of viruses, but specifically to your question in this trial, 87% were of the UK variant. Wow. Yeah, so um, Dr. Miller, can you explain that graph that has the red and the blue, just so my viewers can understand what that's showing and how impressive that is? Yeah, so if you look here, this is the viral load and this is the, the day. And if you're looking at these time points, this is logarithmic. So this is like, we're going from tens of millions to millions right here mm -hmm. in this. Now, the red line is your control, and the control, of course, goes down, but it doesn't go down nearly as fast. And this separation of these lines by these called standard deviations 
tells you whether something is statistically significant. Right. And, you, and there's your p-value, which means it's highly significant. So this isn't to happen by accident. This is showing, if you look right between the first 24 hours, it drops significantly. We're talking tens of millions to, to, to a million. And so what that means, how, what does that, like, so what? What does that mean? Well, we know from other studies that others have done in monoclonal antibodies is that the lower the viral load in the beginning, the less the symptoms and the less hospitalization. So others yeah. have shown that. So the most important thing that we could show here is that how fast can we bring down the viral load? So we bring down basically the viral load to non-detectable levels within, within uh, 72 hours. What does that mean to you and I? That means that if we, if we can bring the viral load down from tens of millions down to like thousands, tens of thousands, that means within that short period, that means that, that if I sneeze on you and I have COVID and you get some, if you get a little bit of virus in your nose, say, say you get a thousand, what we call a titer, say you get a thousand in your nose. Well, a thousand is nothing to the nasal spray. Even if it, even if it lodges and it does get into your, into, your, into your host cell, into your cells and starts replicating, even if they come out, if you use this spray once or twice a day, you're going to knock down the viral load. We've already shown it knocked down the viral load. So therefore, it's going to make you less infected. It's also going to make you less infectious because your viral load will be lower so you won't be sneezing on other people. So we're very excited about this. And this and you, there's a lot of other nasal sprays out there and things like that, but no one that I'm aware of has done what we've done in a randomized controlled trial, highly controlled and show statistically significant differences. So we're the only nasal spray out there there's some other ones that are like have blocking, you know, they'll claim all sorts of things, but this is nitric oxide and this is, this works and reduces viral load very fast and can be used against any virus. So for sure. I, I love this. I love this study. I love that graph. Um, one thing for our viewers too, is viral load is super important. And they think that's why a lot of respiratory therapists, for example, um, you know, get so ill when they're infected with COVID is because they get a really high viral load when they get infected. So, um, yeah, that is super important. Um, and as much as I love this study, Dr. Miller, I really, really wish we could have had a third arm that was no saline, no nothing, you know, <laughs> just so yeah, we could see the would, three trajectories. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, and then that, you know, you can't imagine how hard it is to run these kind of trials. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like how, do you, how do you do your informed consent? How do you do your, you know, like the logistics of doing these trials has been, well, it's certainly been a learning experience for me. For sure. For sure. And it sounds like you have bigger trials ahead, which is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So Dr. Miller, as far as this being approved for emergency use in the world, like where, where is your product already being used? Okay. So it's approved in Israel mm -hmm. and it's approved in Bahrain. Okay. And it's being evaluated in many countries. The challenge for the regulators is nitric oxide. Like it doesn't fit in any little box. It mm -hmm. doesn't. Right. So and of course, because of the babies and the intensive care unit, nitric has only been looked at as a prescription drug, right? Right. So even though that in this bottle, coming out of this bottle is a, it's a, it's a half a percent of what we give the babies. So it's very, very low. And even though right. it's very, very low, now some, some regulatory groups as in Israel, and of course, areas where they have problems they're more motivated mm -hmm. they are looking at it as a medical device so instead of as i explained in the mechanisms of action if you focus on the viricidal effect outside the cell then by definition it's a device and it's not interacting with the body 
So sure. we've, also, we've also shown that the primary metabolite of nitric oxide delivery is what we call methemoglobin, and you can measure that. And so we've shown very clearly that even when we use um, large volumes in, 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 in the nasal lavage, which is 240 mils compared to a, a full treatment of the nasal spray is a half a mil, we don't get increase in that hemoglobin levels. So it doesn't, we, there's no systemic effect here. The question is, with the regulators is, does it, depending on the definition, does a chemical reaction on the, vir, on the virion define it as a drug? Now, some jurisdictions say yes. Some say if it doesn't interact with the cell and enter the body, then it's, a, then it's not a drug. So every jurisdiction is scratching their heads of where to put pigeonhole um, our, our intervention. And in some places going fast, they get it. They go, uh-huh. Some places are like in Canada, they get it. But just because it's on the list as a prescription drug, that means we have to go through the full drug. Now, so in Canada right now, we are submitting for a new drug submission. We have approval to start a phase three trial and we're, we'll be applying for emergency use access. Now, of course, we have hardly any cases here now. So, but what we will do is establish the study here, then we'll move it to India or to Indonesia or places that don't have the vaccine. And that's really what's motivating me now is it's, I want to get it to places where they don't have access to the vaccine. Right. Right. The places where they really need it. Exactly. Okay. So, so what about a place like India or Indonesia? Do they want to have these phase three trials completed before you can use it there or how does no, that work? We're right in the middle of negotiation with all of them about if we start a phase three trial, they'll give us, it looks like they'll give us emergency use while we're collecting the data and much like the vaccines right i mean the vaccines mm -hmm. do the same thing they approved yeah. while they're collecting data and the safety profile is so good on this like there's like again we're half a percent compared to what we're using with babies for 15 7 you know 24 7 7 days a week and we've used it for almost 20 years so and the safety profile is spectacular on nitric alone on a half a percent transiently in your nose, um, it's got a very good safety profile. Plus we did the study in Canada on 103 individuals and there was absolutely no adverse effects directly related to the drug mm. for nasal spray. Got it, got it. Well, that's good to know. So all in all, we can't really overdo it is what you're saying. Like if I had this nasal spray and I sprayed it every 10 minutes, I, I couldn't overdose. Um, no, it would be very, very, very hard to overdose. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Um, if you think ahead. about it, you're a, med you're a medical person. So um, fractional expired nitric oxide levels. So if you measure the nitric you're exhaling, as you have a infection, that level goes up. If you, you were to have a pulmonary infection, if you were to measure pneumonia and measure the fractional expired nitric oxide, it would go up because that's your body's natural defense. It's not regulating nitric oxide. Right. So our value is right around that level. So we're using the level that the body uses anyways on a localized topical area. So, and we have no systemic effects. So makes sense. Makes sense. Um, so I kind of have a really strange question, but you know, you're talking about the ingredients mixing when you squirt the spray, um, does it feel weird or is it just like spraying saline up your nose? Is it like bubbly or is it just like a normal, have you ever done a neti pot? I have. Okay. It's not the most fun experience. No, it's not. And if you've ever made the mistake and not use saline or the better, the better one I give to people. Have you ever accidentally inhaled uh, water at the pool when you're swimming? Yeah. Yeah, it really makes your eyes open, right? Definitely, definitely. So, so it's not like that. Okay. So, so it's, 
it's um it's stringent you know you're you know you're getting it like it, it it's it does, it's not painful but it's uh it, you know you're getting it does it have like a flavor no hmm. no it doesn't have flavor it doesn't have a smell it's just it's just spraying something in your nose that's strong got it got it okay so I use the word stringent, but I, there's nothing to that I can relate. It's not as bad as a pool, breathing in pool. It's not as bad as a nasal lavage because we use nasal lavage and people that use 240 mils in their nose, because it's the same dose, but 240 mils, the spray's only half a mil. So it's not really. Not that much. Yeah. It's there. I mean, you know, it's there. It's not like saline. So it's not totally inert, but it's does it's not painful, but it's not, you just know it's there. It's not stingy, but strong. Strong would be a word. Mm-hmm. Strong sensation. Got it. I mean, really kids, interesting. My kids use it. I mean, you know, I mean, people use it. The cows, when you spray it in the cow's nose, the cows don't do anything. Mm. So it's not like they jerk their head back or anything. So it's right. not that kind of reaction. Got it. Got it. So stepping back from the COVID-19 pandemic, um, this spray and this solution has many other applications, right? You already alluded a little bit to some of them. Are there other areas where you're starting to research or um, kind of besides the sinusitis, trying to really focus your efforts? Yeah, there's some, well, unbeknownst to many people, out there, we have some ac- an acne product that no one knows that we're inside it that works very well. Um, there's uh, we have a, a foot bath, athlete's foot bath that's out there, but we don't tell anybody that nitric's in it or that we're in it. So yeah, so it's a it works really good against fungi. There's lots of once you start learning about this, people keep saying, oh, have you thought about this? Well, we've thought about a lot of things, but it, it, it's another thing, proving it's safe and effective. So that's the, that's the journey that we're on. So there's lots of, lots of things that we could be using it for, but we're, we're just kind of the silver lining of COVID was, is that we get to use this for viral. Once, once, once COVID's over, we'll at least have something in our tool belt when the next pandemic comes and we'll have something that works extremely well against the flu and the common cold. So nice. I'm hoping my, my, my dream is that, uh, is that when I see, you know, when I come to Hawaii, I'm on the airplane, someone's got one of these bottles in their purse and they go, got it. cause that's, that's what I do. And, yeah, I mean that seems pretty reasonable. Yeah, we got lots of anecdotal things out in Bahrain. They're just they're having some very fun, exciting things. Where um, one that was just related to me this week was um, an 88 year old um, grandparent um, was on the nasal spray, and every five people in the household all got COVID, and the person that had the highest risk. Um, had the nasal spray and didn't get sick. So wow. <laughs> that was kind of fun. Spray nice. again, those, are, those are anecdotal, got lots of anecdotal stories until you've done the randomized controlled trial. No one's going to believe you anyways, but, 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 but it's, it, it, I, I firmly believe I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't believe it worked and there wasn't other applications for it. For sure. For sure. What's the shelf life of one of those bottles? So, um, again, it mostly has to do with the regulatory question and stability. And, but that's why inside this, the magic inside is we have two separate chambers. If we were to put the stuff together, we can, it produces nitric oxide all the time. And so the half-life is only like three or four days. But when we keep the components apart, it's stable like for two years. Okay. It'll have a, and that's what we're, of course, we have to prove that it's stable for two years. We haven't done it for two years, but we have accelerated testing. And so, and we've done, use it for other things like the nasal lavage. So we have data on that, but specifically Mm -hmm. on the nasal spray, we anticipate it will be two years, 
But once you open the bottle, 28 days. Okay. You have enough spray for a month. Okay. Anyway, so yeah, that's the goal is this has enough spray to prevent for 28 days. So you just throw that in your purse or your pocket and use it whenever you go to the grocery store or someone sneezes on you or you go to day, take your kids to daycare or whenever you think you're being exposed. Some people have said, you know, there's two, two explanations. People say, oh, it's like hand sanitizer for the nose. Yes. Because then the question is, is, do you have prevention or treatment? Well, what's hand sanitizer? Is it prevention or treatment? It depends. You know, the virus is there. You have to have it there to kill it or prevent it, right? Then, then someone else came up with a brilliant thing is it's the, it's, it's the morning after treatment for viral infection. Meaning that if you've been exposed, you got the treatment or you can use it beforehand and have an environment where the, the virus can't can thrive. So, Yeah, so that's a good analogy. But what's nice about how you're saying the shelf life is two years is I'm thinking in the future, like you were alluding to future pandemics, potentially this could be stockpiled and ready for use if needed. Exactly. Yeah. Do you feel if we got the regulatory approvals that you'd be able, your company would be able to ramp up production pretty fast? That is exactly what we're trying to do right now is, and that is, uh, uh, we are, our, our business model never anticipated production. We were going to license this out, but it's happened so fast that, that we are learning lots. And uh, so we'll be, we'll be ramping up to like the demand is far outstripping what we can produce. So we have sites in the United States, we have sites in Mexico, we have site, a site in Israel, and we're working with India to see if we can get this up to the tens of millions of bottles. Wow, wow. So theoretically, if I could purchase this or I flew to Bahrain and purchased one, what, what's the price point for a bottle? Well, again, it depends on the market, right? Because yeah. it depends if it's, a, is it, is it, is it classified as a drug or is it classified as a medical device? So we kind of leave it to the local areas, but the point is, is, and our, our, mandate for anybody we're doing business with distributors in the area or the pharmaceuticals is we want equitable access and equitable access is so important we don't want this for those that can afford primary care health care only we want it to be accessible so we're pushing otc and to be otc then like in israel it's um it's 30 dollars a bottle but in other places, it may be $10 a bottle. So the world is like that right now. It's global. And we as, we as the privileged should be willing to pay a little bit higher price to help those that are not so privileged. And that's the way I look at it. Absolutely. I love that philosophy. It is super hard, though, to ensure you know, equitable access worldwide. That's a huge challenge. Yeah. And so we're doing our very best at that. And we're, I think people are getting it. It's a little easier during COVID, right? People are a little right. bit more anxious to uh, to be ethical, I think. For sure. Great. Well, this has been so enlightening. I feel like I learned a lot talking with you, Dr. Miller. Is there anything else you wanted to add just about your company, your dreams, your legacy, your building, any of those things before we adjourn? No, just... Um... I just, uh, no, I just thank you for, for talking. So, you know, not a lot of people ask me about this, right? So it's fun to talk about it. Totally. Okay. It is. It's super fun and fascinating stuff. Um, kind of on a side note, are you, you're still teaching, right? No, I had to retire Aww. last year. And, uh, and I do miss that, but I've, but you know, once you put your foot into the dark side, every, your academic world's gone. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. All I think, all, all, all everybody thinks now is that I'm the evil pharmaceutical guy. Right? Oh boy! So I can't even, I can't even publish anymore, right? Oh. Like I put in a, uh, I put in an article about the nasal spray kind of thing during COVID, and no one would publish it because 
Yeah, you know, I was being transparent, right? I, I, I'm with a company. I'm with my own company, right? So, so mm -hmm. there's trade-offs, but I've uh, I've done what I can in the academic world, and and helped that along and published papers and done that. Now my 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 goal now is to, which has always been my dream, is to get it to where it needs to get to. Is the people, the people that it benefits, and that's really why you and I are in this field, right? We want to help people. So yeah, that's the goal. I love it. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And um, I'm going to be keeping an eye on you and where, where things will be approved and when, and hopefully, hopefully you are widespread and this is available worldwide. Seems like such a great thing. And I'm looking forward to seeing all of your studies. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Take care, Chris. Thanks again. Great talking to you. Likewise. Bye-bye.